This particular talk will be on resources. And when I look at resources, it can be all kinds of things. Uh, nowadays, documentaries would have been included in resources. When I was young, there just wasn't a lot of documentaries about strength training or nutrition. And now they're very popular. I think the first one I knew of was Pumping Iron. And I saw that at the premiere there in San Francisco. But today, I'm going to include resources basically in two kinds what I call mentors, those people who guided me and ideally those people in your life who are guiding you, and then books that have stood the test of time. So let's begin. My book, 40 Years with a Whistle, uh, was written when I realized that <clears throat> I'd spent about 40 years of my life outside, in gyms, in weight rooms, on fields, in stadiums, coaching. And now I realize that uh, we're now sneaking up on my 50th year of doing this. And I wanted to just share some of the insights I've had in my athletic career and my coaching career. So we begin with probably my favorite quote ever to start a book. And there's been some good ones. This is the best of times and the worst of times. But in the beginning of Frank Herbert's book, Dune, there's this great line. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. Uh, boy, I wish, I think we all do. We wish we'd go back in time to when we first started weightlifting there, first got interested in fitness or a sport and took the time to make sure that we had everything in check, all of our, uh, throw in whatever cliche you want to say, but everything just kind of lined up to work perfectly. Of course, that rarely happens. But in my case, I kind of lucked out. In 1965, when I first started lifting weights, my Aunt Marie died and my brothers, and I should mention, she left us 500 bucks. And my brothers went to Sears, uh, which maybe by the time this is you're listening to this doesn't exist anymore. And they bought the Sears 110 pound uh, Ted Williams barbell set. Uh, 110 pounds is about 50 kilos. And basically, and I, I rebought the little booklet years ago, I still have it. Uh, it's interesting, it cost me $37 to buy the little eight-page booklet, and I think the original Sears weightlifting set cost maybe $29. But basically, Ted taught us very a few things. He said, put weights overhead, pick them up off the floor, basically two sets of five. He suggests us to clean and press, the curl, the clean and jerk, shrugs, a forward raise, ab work, the snatch, and pullovers. Oddly, it took me about 35 years after this to realize that that was probably the best advice I ever got in my life as, as a lifter and as a coach and as a track and field athlete, athlete. Put weights over your head, pick them up off the floor, two sets of five, thank you so much, we'll see you tomorrow. But things did change. In 1970, I was gonna go from St. Veronica's to Southwood Junior High, and I wanted to play football. I wanted to play football in the worst way. So I went to the Orange Library there in South San Francisco, and I book, picked up a book called Bodybuilding and Self-Defense by Miles Callum. And I love the book. In fact, I, I still own it today. And in fact, it's this book right here. Um, and then I went to the football section to see if I could improve myself as a football player. And I didn't really find any books that were, you know, really appropriate for making me a better football player. But Elliot Asinoff's book, Seven Days a Sunday, was there. And I think it'd be one of the first books I ever read, start to finish, uh, that wasn't either an assigned book or a book about, I don't know, uh, you know, an adolescent book. Let's just say that. And then, of course, the librarians recommended the book, The Sword and the Stone, which I picked up. Uh, and I remember seeing and loving the Disney movie from a few years before. And, of course, this book uh, transformed my life. In Callum's book, he talks a lot about things that would take me a long time to re-understand. The quote I use most of the time with Callum is this particular one here. Um, he's talking about tension or isometrics. This method, isometrics tension, is based on a new theory, and you have to remind yourself that the book's from 1962, of muscle growth. German and American scientists and doctors have found that a muscle can grow at only a certain rate 
And according to this theory, it doesn't take as much work as we used to think. Even at that time, uh, the work of DeLorme and Watkins still wasn't out as big as it would be. And of course, it, and it still sticks around now. But a lot of people were trying to find even faster ways of getting stronger. If you flex, it goes on to say, any muscle to its maximum power and contraction and hold it there for six seconds once a day, the scientists say the muscle will grow in strength. And I underline in strength just as fast as it can grow in strength. So this is one of those things, those, those, those little hints, those little gems, those little whispers in your ear that you always have to remember as a strength coach. To get stronger, we might meet, need a lot less than we think. But the problem is most of us don't, we forget that we're trying to get strong. We're thinking of something else. Whether or not this method of muscle tension can ever really replace weightlifting is still a matter of controversy. It did not. Some scientists say it can. Endless repeating of strenuous exercises, they say, does not make the strength of a muscle grow any faster. Weightlifting, however, may make the size of the muscle grow faster. And there it is right there. As a strength coach, we are constantly dealing with the fact that the boys especially always want to get big guns. And many of the females I work with just want to talk about six-pack abs. These, that's body composition. That's hypertrophy. That's bodybuilding. I thought you wanted to be a better triple jumper. I thought you wanted to be an American football player. Well, strength and hypertrophy or bodybuilding work are not the same thing. It took me 45 years to understand the true role of tension and arousal. We've gone on this before, but really physical tension and arousal levels are two of the tools we use to hone our athletes into optimal performance. If you decide you want to deadlift heavy or squat heavy, you're going to need a lot of tension. But you don't need that kind of tension if you want to throw the discus or hit a golf swing. You've got to learn to marry your tension and arousal levels with what the performance you're trying to do is. Uh, from there, of course, and it's taken me a while to come there, is I call it pull my finger, but basically it's the three P's of performance. Um, here's my finger here, my extended index finger. Now, what we want to do with the plank and isometric family is teach that finger to hold as straight and as still as we can. Um, the next thing we want to do is teach, like a typing, as I always use the example, typing about how to use, uh, we're trying to teach the body how to push. But a true elite performance comes from learning to snap our fingers. So this is the job of the strength coach. I've got to teach you to be rigid. I've got to teach you to push, pull, squat, hinge. And then I've got to teach you to do all that as fast as you possibly can. And of course, this is where my movement matrix came from. Uh, one of the things about the push family, that'd be your traditional weightlifting exercises, it also provides the hormonal cascade that allows your body to do things like get bigger and in uh, other cases, um, get faster and get better at some certain things. So to, to beat this dead horse, in, in a perfect world, uh, we would begin uh, with the young athlete learning the ballistic movements, uh, the snap movements first, the Olympic lifts, the swings, kettlebell snatches, and basic plyometrics. Teach the young athlete how to be powerful, fast, explosive, and then build on that later with the grinds, which are the power lifts in general, uh, a push, pull, hinge, and squat. And then after that, we would build on hypertrophy, making the athlete, uh, well, bigger, and also making you look better because everyone seems to want to do that. In a perfect athletic career, you would learn the Olympics lifts first, then the power lifts, and then shift the bodybuilding. And of course, what's happening today is the exact opposite. People come into weightlifting, basically everybody bodybuilds at first, and then they find another strength sport. And very often they'll find that some of the lessons they learned in bodybuilding didn't carry over 
and, until they're explosive sports. Um, very often at a Highland Games, a guy will look really, really good in his kilt and his t-shirt because he, he comes from a bodybuilding trans, uh, tradition, but doesn't do real well when it comes time to throw the various implements. Um, we can move on. And of course, this leads to this concept called snapacity that I invented. Um, you, want to, you want to be able to snap, and I tie the word snap in with work capacity, snapacity, which means I want you to have a lot of snaps. I want you to have more snaps than your opponent. I want you to have more snaps than anybody else. Because the more you snap, the farther you throw, jump, leap, play, whatever. In the book, Seven Days to Sunday, on Wednesday, I found out about a guy named Kenny Avery. And even though the chapter's a lot more, it was this particular section that I fell in love with. I'm not going to read the entire thing there for you. It's there for you to come back and read. But basically, he gets involved in push-ups, sit-ups, and chin-ups. Later, he starts taking ballet lessons. And then in his junior year, the last paragraph, I made linebacker. I was able to knock down big guys weighing 200 pounds behind the line of scrimmage. I was quick. I got even quicker. In the spring, I ran the high hurdles, shot put through the discus, and ran the high half mile. When I went to Southwood Junior High for track, I did the high hurdles, shot put, the discus, and the half mile. Very quickly, I realized the half mile wasn't helping me. I continued doing the high hurdles all through high school and uh, the shot put all through college too. And the reason I'm a discus thrower was from this chapter of the book. And as I note here, I followed this good advice. And of course the discus ended up taking care of my entire athletic career. The other book of course is A Sword in the Stone, which I still have this wonderful uh, love affair with. And I have one of my favorite quote, uh, parts of the entire collection is when he pulls the sword out of the stone, the war, uh, King Arthur, walked up to the great sword for the third time. He put out his right hand softly and drew it out as gently as if from a scabbard. Uh, his friends tell him just before he does that, power springs from the nape of the neck. Use those forearms held together by the chest. Find your tool, never let go. Keep up a steady effort. Fold your powers together with the spirit of your mind. Well. In my career, that particular little set of quotes has set up how I train people. Uh, all power leaps uh, from the nape, nape of the neck. Uh, that's the Olympic lifts and kettlebell ballistics. Uh, use those forearms held together by the chest. That's anaconda training. Find your tool. Um, when we talked about can you go about what, the toolkit to fit your needs. Uh, of course, Never Let Go is my signature line and the title of my best-selling book. Um, keep up a steady effort uh, one more time, little and often over the long haul. And of course, number six is all about mental training in all of its forms, something I thought was very important since my very first day as an athlete and a coach. So... One of the hard things to get across to a lot of people, and it's an example from breakfast this morning again, science is very important to what you do, but don't ignore your experience. Now, if you remember all the way back to the eschatology talk, we talked about a few things, and I've, I've got a small set of notes here. Your experience, that's from authorities, uh, the best of the best, and yours, plus science, is probably the best way to go. So you need both experience and science to help you towards your goal. But the other thing that most people think forget is then be sure you talk to other people who are on the same path. Discuss, dialogue, think, try to keep moving ahead. Phenomenology is the key to understanding how to improve as an athlete, as a coach, and as a basic human being. Uh, so the science that I always fall back on, and this uh, grinding this one more time, Delorme, Watkins, and progressive resistance exercise. Um, I have used this particular uh, chapter in this book countless times in my career. Basically, between 15 and 30 total reps, 
total reps, that's three sets of eight, five sets of five, that whole family of things, is probably going to do the best for you of any program. And I always tell people, if you want a good workout, three sets of eight and a push, three sets of eight and a pull, three sets of eight and a squat, three sets of eight in some kind of hinge movement like a deadlift, and then go for a farmer walk. And that's a pretty good workout. It's going to take care of almost everybody for every goal. And DeLorm and Watkins, of course, just completely changed the way we look at weightlifting. They brought us the modern concept of sets and reps. They figured out that you don't need to do a lot of work, um, 10 sets of 10, but the important thing is to be progressive. Always be progressive as best you can. And of course, I also use Heidegger's book, The Physiology of Strength, as, as a basic foundational tool. Most of the research in this book was done in the 40s and 50s, uh, translated into English in around 61. Um, he, he, they studied how strength increases generally a little bit differently by, by uh, muscle. Um, men are stronger than women. <clears throat> but the great insight from that, of course, is women can be 80% as strong as men in here, but only 55% as strong in the forearm extensor. Now, why is that important? Well, if you're teaching young ladies how to do the shot put, they'll be able to glide or rotate on day one, but they're going to need some extra time working with the ball or lighter shots to let that forearm develop and build up. Um, I've always been bothered by the phrase throws like a girl because really it's just bad coaching that allows that to happen. Um, this has been very true in my life. Strength peaks in the early, uh, late 20s and maintains for a long, long time. Uh, and then it generally declines, but very slow, very slow if you've been working out. Um, there's a discussion in the book about training in the summer, why people do so much better there. And in this book, they say it could be vitamin D. Vitamin D, again, is not a vitamin. It's a pro-hormone. And we sent, tend to get it, most of us, simply by using the sun. Of course, that last little part of the book where they say injecting testosterone seems to help everybody is also about to show what's going to happen in elite performance with the introduction of a whole variety of performance enhancing drugs. So yes, science is very important, but don't forget your experiences and asking what the best of the best are doing. So in my life, after those three books, the following year, so in 1970, I go to the library, get the books. In 71, I go to Southwood. Every day we had this little interesting little workout. We would do two laps, an obstacle course, and do a general warm up, which most people would recognize as calisthenics. And if you want to learn more, get those old Royal Air Force uh, conditioning books and things like that. Jump rope and cherry pickers and all the rest. But after that, we went in the weight room and we did a little simple program, eight, six, four. A set of eight followed by a set of six followed by a set of four. If you got all of them, you went up next time. We did the power clean, military press, front squat, bench press, and then we went and played games and sports. What was great about this program is that we were in a large group, about 50 athletes. Uh, we had those Ted William barbells, which were still around. We would work in four person cohorts. Um, if I was bench pressing, I had two side spotters and a head spotter. And then after I got up, we switched, we switched, we switched, and then it was my turn again. Boy, you went fast doing that. Three years later, this group of junior high kids from Southwood, we dominated our varsity team. We, the, most of the starters were from Southwood. So it worked. Now, was it a perfect program? When I first re-looked at this program back in two, uh, 2019, um, the first thing that came up in my head was, it worked. It, it, it worked. It's okay if it works. Now, on the weaknesses side, it lacked a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there's no loaded carries. But we did do gymnastics work in, on the obstacle course. So it was a lot of good. Let's not worry too much about the weaknesses first. The strength is that we lifted and our opponents did not. So our opponents always had a gap. So I always go back to this great article from Dave Davis, Track and Field Technique, 
in its over two editions in the March and April 1974. Brian Oldfield, Al Feuerbach, Bruce Wilhelm, and Sam Walker favored the quick lifts, while George Woods and Randy Matson learned uh, leaned towards the strength lifts. If there is any real consensus among champion shot putters, it was that a mixture of quick and strength lifts is effective. So if you're combining the clean with the power lifts, adding the snatch and clean and doing the power lifts, your program's going to be pretty good. And trust me, pretty good is a good place to be. It was right after I graduated from high school, and that was me in my staying there in my football uniform, I met Dick Notmeyer, and I joined the Pacifica Barbell Club. And Dick, uh, obviously the influence of Dick on my life is through the roof. Uh, he always was able to summarize everything very quickly. He was the Montaigne of our generation. He was the one who taught me famously on longevity. Half genetics, 40% lifestyle, and don't forget it's 10% luck. This wonderful thing about the way he looked at programs, he believed that a program should be whatever you're doing in competition, we should be doing here in the gym. So if in the Olympic list, for example, he wouldn't allow us to power any of the movements up. We had to do every single lift from 45 all the way up on the bar to whatever. It had to look like we were on the platform at the weightlifting meet. I never realized what a brilliant bit of insight that was. On nutrition, he basically had one little thing. Whether you agree with it or not, it doesn't matter. But his whole thing was, what did you eat for breakfast? And if it was meat and eggs and other stuff, it was good. If it wasn't meat and eggs, it was not good. He felt that strength athletes, and since we trained at 3 in the afternoon, he was probably right, needed a big foundation of protein to start the day. And on training, we basically did three movements. The snatch, the clean and jerk, and the front squat. I remember when the Bulgarian secrets came out and they were, and they were everyone was just amazed that they did just three exercises, the snatch, the clean, and the front squat. I remember thinking, that's what Dick Notmeyer was teaching me back in 1975. After Dick, I went up to Utah State University to throw with Ralph Mon, which had been my goal for a long time. Not only was he... Uh, He's considered the greatest Aggie, uh, Utah State Aggie, but he also played football for the Detroit Lions, made the U.S. Olympic team, and fought at the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. So he, he knew his stuff. Uh, his favorite joke was, be reasonable, do it my way, which as a coach, I began to appreciate longer and longer and longer the more I've been around. Uh, he is absolutely right on this. His formula for greatness and everything Make yourself a slave to, do, to good habits. Um, you know, you are, as you sit, as you listen, the sum of all your habits. This guy right here, I am the sum of all my habits, good and bad, for the last couple of decades. Uh, the four Fs would be like things like fitness, food, family, friendship. I, I love to use that line. And the truth on all those areas, especially in performance, little and often over the long haul. And the first day I ever got a chance to sit down with him, I asked him, Coach, what's the secret to throwing the discus far? He said, sure, lift three days a week, throw four days a week for the next eight years. And I think one of the things a lot of people miss is the next eight years. It's a simple formula, but it's not easy. Coach Mon was an amazing coach, and I'm just honored to be one of his athletes. Now, the interesting thing about um, Dick Notmeyer and Ralph Mon is when I showed up to Dick Notmeyer's gym, I weighed 162 pounds. Four months later, I weighed 202 pounds, and not long after, I weighed 231. Uh, out of 50% increase in body mass, basically at this time, by focusing on the Olympic lifts and getting myself to train with a focus on throwing the discus farther. I know that sounds strange, but everything led to the discus going farther. And I literally became a different person by training the very simple 
techniques of both Dick Notmeyer and Coach Mott. And uh, this is only this is a four year picture, maybe a three year difference set of pictures. But it was a night and day transformation for me in my career. It was simpler than the things I had done in high school. My training in college was much simpler than what I did in high school. Uh, it, it, it even now sometimes I have a hard time wrapping my hands around that. Uh, I could write out my entire program for you in just a few sentences. I lifted three days a week by snatching, cleaning, and squatting. And then I threw about, well, I threw more than four or five days a week, but, and then doing a lot of discus throwing. My body responded by basically having itself uh, again. It's pretty impressive. What you might miss is this so far, a couple of things. From 1967 to today, I'm always listening to the best. I've had great conversations with Dick Notmeyer, Ralph Mon, Tommy Kona, the, 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 the former. He was Mr. Universe and also Olympic champion in weightlifting. Pretty good. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain, the great basketball player. Fortune Gordine, great discus thrower. Glenn Passy, great discus thrower. Coach K, the basketball coach. Jerry Sloan, a basketball coach. Jim Schmitz, our national, uh, uh, our Olympic uh, coach. Uh, Jim Fossa, who took the Giants to the Super Bowl. Uh, coach McBride, this great uh, local Utah, University of Utah coach. Robbie Robinson, the black prince of weightlifting. Arnold, Stefan Fernholm. Uh, Swedish discus thrower, uh, Gernot Brecht, uh, a German discus thrower, Jimmy Johnson, American football coach. I'm always listening to new voices, trying to understand more. From 1970 to today, I've read every strength and health magazine ever, I think. Um, every book and journal I can get my hands on. Uh, in 1971, track and field on the book mentioned Ralph Mon, and that's the reason I chose to go to Utah State. And since 1971, to this very day, I keep a journal. Mine is right there, right now. Every single day I write in my journal. When I look at over this, it reminds me of a couple things I've, I've learned. Uh, in 1986, I had an opportunity to go to a football camp, uh, clinic. And I got there early because I wanted to use the weightlifting equipment so I get a workout in. And as I walked in, I saw Jimmy Johnson, a man who's going to win the national championships as a college football coach for Miami and later win two Super Bowls with the Dallas Cowboys. When I came in to, uh, to lift, he saw me, said, you want to come to breakfast? Well, it was an opportunity I'll never, ever forget. First, for those of you I've been very kind to, you should thank Jimmy Johnson. But when he summed what it takes to be a great football coach, American football, he said, you have to simplify everything. Don't confuse yourself. That's money. Number two, it comes down to conditioning. He liked to be in better condition than the opponent. And then the big thing for him was you had to win the sudden change game. That's when the ball goes over. You get the ball or the ball or, or they get the ball because of your mistake. Uh, in American football, we call that interceptions and fumbles. But every game has this. And what got me thinking on this was that he had circled a part of the game called sudden change. And he said, this is the game changer. And since then, I always, when I start to help coach somebody, I try to find that one or two, that hidden thing that allows you to win if you succeed in dominating this one area. And of course, that became a whole bunch of different things that we've been covering in this class. It was a life-changing moment. In 1979, my coaching career began. Now, when I first coached, I coached at Utah State, and I worked with the track team in the weight room. Uh, my toolkit was simple. Uh, I knew the Olympic lifts, and I had a lot of good experience. And I make a, it's, it's, well, it's true. Let me just read it. I was close-minded, close-eared, and authoritarian. I was young, dumb, and dangerous. When I started listening more, I got smarter. Uh, this, by the way, is my uh, junior varsity football team. Uh, probably one of the funnest experiences of my career. Uh, I'll bore you sometime at, uh, uh, with all the details. It was in 1982 when I had a chance to talk with one of the, our opponent's head coaches. And his name was Rick Bojack, and he died just recently. He told me two things that were hard for me to hear at the time. The first thing he said was, 
you've got to out rep your opponent. I said, okay, of course. Yeah, I got that. And then he put his finger on my chest and he said, Dan, you can't get bored. What? You can't get bored. And I've used some, I've used that touch of wisdom my whole career. When I'm coaching the discus, I've seen the discus turn. I've seen the discus turn uh, a million reps, maybe an exaggeration, but it's not far from it. But my young thrower, who's 13 years old, hasn't seen it a million times. I can't get bored because it's new and exciting to that young man or young woman. The second thing he told me was a system. He ran an offense called the Veer. Well, we do the Veer. So I focus on the Veer. Every other aspect of our game supports the Veer. Our practices just focus on the Veer. Nobody does more the Veer than us. Well, I took this later on to say, okay, the discus is all about the full turn, throwing in the full turn. So I focus on the full turn. Every other aspect of discus throwing is fine, but it supports the full turn. Our practices focus on the full turn. Nobody does the full turn more than us. Absolutely illuminating insight. And yet I will still talk to people who want to improve their distance running by talking about the weight room. The weight room can support that, of course. But what is your system for your distance running? It should be distance running. This got me ready for one of the most amazing days of my life when Bill Koch, the Olympic medalist and world champion, came to Salt Lake City. In 1985, here in Salt Lake, there was an eight-hour workshop with the world champion for $10. Well, I don't care what the sport is, I'm going. The interesting thing I noticed is that I was the only person in the audience who could hear him speak. And the reason was he was saying things that didn't sound right to the audience. The cross-country skiers in the audience at the time, uh, they were heavily influenced by early periodization. So they wanted to ask him questions about mesocycles, microcycles, hours on this, hours on that. And he kept saying the same basic things. Intervals are the biggest bang for the buck. He felt that hard skating, resting, hard skating, resting. I should say skiing. Uh, he's the one who invented the cross country skate. But he believed that interval training was the best thing you can do. So he explained how he trained. Three days a week, he took his daughters to the ski slope. He would skate up the bunny hill and then race his daughters down. They would take the lift up. He'd race up, ski, ski down. Race up, ski down. Right? And his daughters would take the ski lift and bunny hill, ski lift and bunny hill, ski lift and bunny hill. And he would go, he said, until his daughters got tired. And I sat there going, this man is a genius. And of course, the hands would go up and the people would ask, well, what mesocycle do you use? And he would say, I skate up the bunny hill and I skate out. And they missed the whole point of what he was trying to say. This was my first time I ever heard contrarian thinking. If everybody is doing this, you have to at least consider doing the opposite. Not long after, uh, I got married and had a child, uh, two children. I left my wife with two kids, two babies, while I went off for a week at discus camp, the John Powell Discus Camp in Granville, Ohio, Denison College. One of the things I picked up at this camp, and I had a lot of years at this camp, is a very simple phrase, throwers throw, jumpers jump, sprinters sprint, swimmers swim. And when you get too far away from that, you start to lose the essence of what's going to make you great. Um, we also learned this camp because the discus by itself, if you have a hundred throwers, can be extremely dangerous. So you don't need a discus to, to teach the discus. You don't need a shot to teach the shot. You don't need a field to teach. If you use your brain, you can teach in any situation, which of course, is, is a big part of what we'll be, we've been learning in, uh, during these lectures. The next thing that we learned 
is we broke off generally into seven groups and we use circuit training to teach techniques. If we have four drills, we would do drill one at one station, dr drill two at another, drill three, drill four. We had another station that we wanted to practice a certain movement with them. Well, we put it at that station. We had another station for this, another station for that. After about 10 minutes, we'd blow a whistle and we'd all rotate. So in 70 minutes, the athlete had a chance to do seven different drills, which is great. But here's the thing, the number of reps on those drills was higher, the athletes told me, than they'd have ever done in one training session. So by using circuits, we're gonna do this here, this here, this here, we were able to train technique, not just what we usually use circuit training for, body composition. The third thing I learned is immersion. Uh, let, me give you the, let me give you the schedule for discus camp. Wake up, throw, eat, throw, eat, throw, eat, throw, go to bed. That's all you did. Now you say, well, so what? Well, here's the thing. As those days carried on, we were dipping you in the deep waters of discus throwing. Everybody you hung around with threw the discus. You were immersed in discus throwing. Uh, I still think to this day that one of the great secrets of improving your skill is to find a way for you to deep dive into it. Four days, five days, six days, seven days. Sometimes you go to a certification, a three-day one, and just go all in where every conversation is about the one thing. And then go home and apply appropriately what you learned. Um, what brought me really to the best part of my career as a coach was this insight that if I don't have facilities for a hundred people to throw and it is dangerous and I don't have things, well, it's actually helpful because it's going to make me think. And the phrase is this, contrarian thinking comes from deprivation. If you don't have a perfect situation, you might be at an advantage because you have to think your way out of it. I taught at a school where we had no ring and we had no field. So we threw these rubberized balls in the walls. Very quickly, we became the best throwing school in the area because we didn't have a field, but our athletes were throwing 100, 200, 300 throws a day. Deprivation is what I think the secret to success. Uh, and of course, then I correct myself here. Wait, overcoming deprivation. Um, in my career with, with children, I've gone without sleep, gone without food, our training facilities. Uh, of course, at Judge Memorial, we had no ring, no field, but nine straight state discus champs. Uh, there was a time in my weightlifting career, I had no lifting bar. I had no time. And of course, now you can just fill in the no, fill in the issue. Decision fatigue is an issue. And the easiest way to get rid of decision fatigue, a decision fatigue, it's when people keep giving you more and more options. If you don't have any options, you just have one, you don't get decision fatigue. Deprivation eliminates decisions. And then you just focus on what you can do versus what you wish you can do. At this time, I also got a real a new principal and watching him really made me a better coach. Uh, it has happened about 1996 when I understood, when I finally got a chance to watch somebody teach me that coaching is leadership. And it's Monsignor uh, Terrence Fitzgerald. Um, he, the, the principles before him were very difficult to work with. Basically, we had two issues. And by the way, most places that are having issues, it's the same too. I especially remember one principal who was always very reactive, not proactive. Uh, if you know my concept of asymmetrical risks, ask what can go wrong. This was somebody who never did that. But when something did go wrong, 
Uh, you'd get dirty, uh, nasty notes in your, your uh, teacher box. You'd get called down to his office so he can bitch and complain about things. Uh, very angry. Okay, we got to fix this. And then, of course, we have the conversation after we fixed it. Well, in the future, what can we do? Oh, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, we got, well, if it happened once, it's going to happen twice. And the other issue is called amoeba responsibilities. Uh, most of us like to know what our responsibilities are. Um, there's a whole series of books about this, but generally in most situations, um, I'm responsible for what's inside this box. Okay. And then outside that box, I'm not responsible for amoeba responsibilities are today. I'm not responsible for this. When something bad happens, suddenly that's my responsibility. I didn't know it was my responsibility, but now it is. That's amoeba your responsibilities constantly uh, change, move. Um, for those of you who've had a bad manager, a bad boss, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I came up with this concept. In fact, this is a, a workshop I gave years ago to a business, and I call it Leadership 101. And here are the two great things I learned from Fists. Number one, constant assessment. And he did this by a concept we call management by walking around. Uh, he visited the classrooms, every classroom, every day. He came to football practice. Now, no coach, no principal in the history of the school had ever been down to football practice. But one of the nice things about that, if he got a complaint by a parent, he would say this, because I know, because I was with him. He said, well, that's interesting. Did you go to, have you been to wrestling practice? No, but this is what my son said. And then he would follow up with it. Because, you know, I have been to wrestling practice and I did not notice this behavior at all. And then, of course, you could hear the, well, you couldn't hear it, but you would also, you would know there was no talking because when you're constantly assessing, when you're constantly walking around, you're constantly looking how to make little things just a little better, you know what's going on. Um, the other thing I learned from him on this particular thing, he was great about ignoring perfect. Once we finished, once we got something done, he would not allow the whatabouts. What about, what should we, okay, the folder's blue, should we make it pink? No, we've done it. Because pretty good is pretty good. Once we get that out there, and if it really needs to be changed, we'll change it. But let's get it out there. Pretty good is pretty good. The next thing, and this is part of my basic coaching one-on-one -on -one stuff, constant upgrading. Always try to make things a little better. Um, the British cyclist team with their mo uh, motto of 1%. Just make it a little better. Um, this ties in, in my mind, ties in well with this next point. <sighs> Don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. As a head coach, I started using this. If you walk up to me and say, little Billy can't play. You'd better have a next sentence. You better say, little Billy can't play, but don't worry. I've got Eddie and Agnes ready to step right in and take care of it. I've gone over everything they need. And the only thing I think we need to worry about is X, Y, or Z. But I've got it covered. Folks, we all got problems. I don't want people who find problems. I want people who solve problems. And if you want to make it in this world financially, become a problem solver, not a problem finder. Now, if there is a truth behind everything I, I've learned from Fitz, is he was a real marvel at understanding the importance of the fundamentals, the basics. Um, you know, he, he didn't like it when we ran too far in certain uh, areas where we kept... He, uh, he didn't want uh, our high school student, students, you know, studying for a semester, you know, uh, Renaissance art in Florence in 1644. He wanted them to study Western history because the fundamentals, the basics, the big picture will prepare you better in life for all the other stuff that's coming up. So the truth here, fundamentals always dominate everything else. Now, as I began to move into my 
third career, 20th career, as an athlete, some things started happening. Uh, I broke my, I broke this wrist quite badly and I had to rethink how I trained because my doctor was very clear. I would never lift weights again. Uh, that didn't happen. And then through 2000, from, from about 2001 through about 2011, I had a series of surgeries that I needed to have done. One from a, two, two from a birth issue and then a few from just sporting issues. But it was at this time I started doing loaded carries. And what I noticed is when I started doing loaded carries, I didn't have to spend as much time in the weight room to get the distances I used to work so hard to get. And I realized something that the best thing I can do to improve you as an athlete isn't necessary to improve your strong points, which we need to do. And yes, it's true. We also need to up your weaknesses. We need to do it. But the biggest thing I can do for you is find what you're not doing, your gaps. And for me, my gap was a loaded carry. And once I started doing them, my performances accelerated so that by the years 2004, even though I was sneaking up on 50 years of age, I was having my lifetime best throws in the discus, which is just very unusual. Now, at the same time, I started working with special forces. And one of the things that can this is their traditional li uh, list from uh, Dick Couch's Great Book series. But there's two points I'd like you to think about. Point number two, quality is more important than quantity. I think that is the most foundationally true thing a strength coach can wrap their arms around. Quality. We need to always think about quality, quality, quality. No bad reps. No missed attempts in a perfect world. Everything should look elegant, should look lovely, should look right. And let me slide you down to the fourth one. Competent special forces cannot be created after the emergency rises. In other words, I, I stole this concept into asymmetric risks. <laughs> Once you've called 911, it's too late to fix the issue with that bad set of squat racks you had. You know that bad set of squat racks? Uh, when you got someone laying on the floor with a you know, bone sticking out of their body, it's too late. You can't wait for the emergencies to fix things. Um, you need to look at your equipment constantly. You need to look at safety constantly. Um, you need to spend the money up front on learning how to do things. So you don't, you don't want to wait until after you dial 911. It's interesting because not once I started doing the loaded carries, the next thing was when I started working with the military and some information from John Powell is when I started combining the hinge or a squat movement followed by sprint or a sled pull. Uh, you'll notice on the picture on the left, I'm not waiting very long. That's an overhead squat for eight with 95 pounds. And the moment I finish rep number eight, I'm sprinting away. Um, that on, the, on the other picture, I'm doing overhead squats followed by a sled pull. And do note that I will not be pulling the sled in the direction of the bar. I'm going to throw the bar away from the sled. Um, the gear change between the hinge and the sprint, or the squat and the sprint, or the hinge and the sled pull, or the squat and the sled pull, that gear change, and you're trying to do as fast as you can, that seemed to do magic to me. Um, I originally used this to help Special Forces guy train, and then I used it for American football, and then I realized it might be the best throwing training we'd ever done. The loads are light, the intensity is through the roof. In 2003, I met Pavel, and this is an important little thing. In 2003, as I started to get more and more successful again, I started doing this thing I call chasing too many rabbits. Pavel and I sat down at Charles Staley's place, and he said to me this, for the next 40 workouts, pick five lifts. Do them every workout. Never miss a rep. In fact, never even get close to struggling. Go as light as you need to go, and don't go over 10 reps in a workout for any of the movements. It's gonna seem easy. When the weights feel light, add more weight. 
On day 22 of this program, I broke lifetime bests in the incline bench, and a few days later, uh, destroyed my old records in the thick bar deadlift. What made me laugh is that when you go back to Ted Williams' little book from 1965, it's two sets of five, pick them up and put them over your head. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to getting strong. The key to doing this workout is what we call the three verticals. These are the three movements that seem to work the best. The vertical pull, a pull-up, a deadlift, deadlift variation, and there's lots of deadlift variations, and the vertical press. Uh, I've done this program for myself many times. I've had, I would say now, honestly, hundreds of people uh, report back to me or I've worked with, and these are the three that work the best in the strength room. You, your mileage may vary, but I'm right on this. What tends to work is this. A press variation, a pull-up variation, a deadlift variation. Uh, kettlebell snatch, about 80 to 120 per workout, vary the load. Or kettlebell swing, 75 to 125 per workout, vary the load. Or the ab wheel. Uh, and finally, the ab wheel. Two sets of five, one set of ten. If you don't like the kettlebell stuff on number four, just do something like uh, loaded carries. So that workout would be press, pull up, deadlift, some kind of loaded carry, vary the movements, the distance, and the load daily, and then ab wheel, thank you very much, you're done. In 2003, an interesting thing happened. <laughs> I started coaching my daughters, and this is us at uh, Juan Diego. Um, it's funny to see how the heights of my daughters because... Uh, Lindsay will be the state champion, the shot put, and Kelly was all state in the discus. And uh, let's just say they're both the shortest. So I called them up and I said, what did you learn from me? And he, I love the list of things they said. Failure is essential and okay. That made me very happy because I taught my daughters it's okay to fail. You get knocked down, you get back up again. Uh, master the basics. Okay, thank you. Last throw, best throw. Always finish as best as you can. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. That's our family motto. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. You might be the slowest, weakest person at the beginning. That doesn't mean you're going to be there at the end too. Uh, squat lower, which I thought was funny. On vacation, don't get too hungry, too tired, or too hot. I, that's true. That's something I emphasize. Uh, my daughter Kelly said, yeah, water, coffee, and wine. I thought, well, that's a good high school coach, but that's okay. And then uh, the one thing Kelly also noticed was tension control, is that by teaching you the deadlift, I also teach you not to kill your kids. You learn to turn your tension on and off as appropriate. But there is one more story. When my daughter Kelly was a sophomore and Lindsay was in the eighth grade, I got a, I got a call. And it's I, I talk about this all the time, but... Uh, I got a call from my daughter, Lindsay, and they didn't have enough coaches out at St. Francis Xavier. So they asked me to uh, go out and coach them. Well, they had no coach. Uh, the two shortest boys in the class were on my team. Magically, uh, the two classes were, uh, the two teams were separated uh, in an interesting way. So I had the two shortest boys. One little girl had had a heart transplant and the only uh, person on the team that had ever played volleyball before was my daughter, Lindsay. So I get the job, I get it. And what I did is ask one of my athletes at the school, what are the three keys to winning in volleyball? And she said, get the serve over and in. So that's number one thing I focused on. Number two, protect the middle. Yeah, don't let balls just fall in the middle. It's okay that they go out. If it's close on the lines, it's close on the lines. But if you protect the middle, good things happen. We protect the middle, and then you have to play as a team. In volleyball, you have to communicate. You don't want to bump into each other. You don't want to both hit the same ball, that kind of thing. And that's all I coached, those three things, because that's all I knew, literally. There's some lessons here from this. From this. Uh, number one, ask around. Somebody, somehow, somewhere has done whatever you're saying before. Um, and I love the idea of picking three things, number two here. Um, in, this, in life, that's the way things tend to work. 
They work in groups of three. Uh, number three, focus on what you say you're going to focus on. Boy, that was a great lesson for me. And when I started applying this to other sports, we became much better. For example, if I say thrower throw, and I see my throwers over there doing jogging or some kind of silly getting them tired exercise, I stop myself and say, hey, throwers throw. Let's get back and let's do what we're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, this next one is hard to understand, but we had a problem. We were very short. We were very experienced. So I made fun of it. And the way I made fun of it is I taught my athletes. This is this was our this was our chant. We're number two. We're number two. There was not an opposing team who ever understood our little chant because that doesn't sound right. We're number two. So I think it helps to poke fun at problems. I think it helps to say if we have the ugliest uniforms, I think I have to say it out. I have to say it out loud first. We have the ugliest uniforms. If if it's raining, I got to poke fun at the rain. It helps. It works. And of course, even though this team didn't win the entire thing, we took third in the tournament. We were the first trophy the school ever got in volleyball. And we were number two. And I think the reason is, is we focused on what we could focus on and let the process dictate our success. The results, we took third. We did pretty good. We won. The team we lost to, um, their coach was a former Division I uh, volleyball player. Uh, she had nothing but club athletes on her team, and she won this little tournament. Good for you. I can guarantee down, downstream, my kids are very successful because of the lessons they learned in being number two. And now, we still use some interesting things to keep learning. One of the things I've been doing since 2010 is intentional community. The idea of intentional community is this. I'm going to set up a workout and say at 930, come to this park. I'm going to bring kettlebells. My friend says, okay, I'll bring sandwiches. Another person says, oh, you got sandwiches. I'll bring extra water and some extra fluids. That's nice. Somebody else says, I'll bring a suspension trainer and some medicine balls. And when we all get there, we are a community. If someone doesn't show up, the person without the water, we're all going to hurt a little bit. And the first thing I say to people is this, what do you want to work on today? And then we begin to organize as a group. It's wonderful. Now, the other thing that most people miss, and this is what I'm sharing with you, is when you are working in with a community, and you say, well, today I'm doing this. Someone might stop you and say, hey, hey, like I was telling everybody last week, I'm going to do this 90-day program. Well, this week I'm doing something else. Well, maybe your friends will lean in and say, well, you know, last week you were saying you're going to do this and now you're doing something else. What's nice about having community is you get this level of discernment among your friends about your decision-making matrix. They're not mean to you. They're just saying, they're reminding you of the path you said you wanted to be on. Of course, course correction show up too. You know, you, you do something and maybe a, friend, a good friend will look at you and say, maybe you should add a little of this. Or, just as important, maybe you ought to drop this since you're already doing this here, here, and here. And of course, the other thing is this. When you see somebody once a week, twice a week, and you're doing a real good program, they might say to you, you know, you look better. And of course, if you look horrible, they might say, you look terrible. They, they help you with the big picture. Uh, I am a huge fan of inter intentional community. Um, these free, organized, fun work workouts. Um, I hope that's part of my legacy. And then, of course, in 19... Uh, pardon me. And then, of course, in 2016, what I consider the best coaching book of all time came out, Think Like a Freak. Um, it's a book on economics, but economics and coaching are almost the same thing. There's three points in the book that I just want to share with you very quickly. Knowing what to measure simplifies life. That is the foundation of being a track coach. 
and a swim coach. Well, in the discus, we measure how far it goes. So if the discus goes farther, we're doing something right. If it goes less far, we're doing something wrong. Conventional wisdom is usually wrong. I love that. Um, talk to somebody who's never thrown the discus or, or anything uh, and ask them, how would you train for that? And they'll tell you some sim silly idea. Conventional wisdom, all you got to do is uh, open. Uh, I go to the barber every so often, and I like to read the magazines before I get cut to tell me how insane the information on exercise and nutrition is. And it's usually wrong. And of course, the biggest one for me is what I call fear of the obvious. Uh, so many people are afraid. Uh, you want to get stronger? Lift weights. You're thirsty? Drink water. Oh, you're hungry? Eat some protein and vegetables. It's fear of the obvious. It's all obvious, but it's all correct. So these are two things I think elite coaches need to know. First is this. They need to understand cost to benefit ratios, the foundational truth of economics. Um, interesting. I think economics classes help coaching more than a lot of other course, courses you can take. The hardest thing about this is twofold. First, you got to learn as a coach, enough is enough. I have seen, I have been an athlete to some coaches whose answer was more, 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 and our performance went down, down, down. The next point on this, on this real simple one, is you can only truly correct the correctable. Now, I have blue eyes, and if I have to do a role in a movie that involves me having brown eyes, we can put little things in my eyes and change my eye color. I can probably change my hair color pretty simply. Uh, uh, from what I've seen from some people, it is possible for me to change the shape of my nose. And maybe I can add an inch or two of height with the right kind of shoes. But I'm not going to be able to compete with those lifts in my shoes. So as a coach, you can only correct what you can correct. You can't keep wishing. Oh, you know, I wish if we were, as a basketball coach, you know, if I had five LeBron Jameses, we'd be a better basketball team. Yeah, okay, but this is what you got. You can only correct what you can correct. I was on a flight one time, and I was talking to a man who had made $885 million selling his company. And you listen to somebody who makes $885 million selling the company. And I said, uh, I go, I don't want to be rude or anything, but can you give me any advice? And he leaned over and said, yeah, as a good CEO, you only make three decisions a year. Now, if you're the boss, if you're the king, you're the guy in charge, if you're the woman on top, you, you cannot constantly make small decisions. You can't go into the cafeteria and say, I don't like this brand of coffee, use this brand. Because that's, now you're just being a pain. you got three decisions a year. And your job is to decide. And the word side is from the same root as scissors, homicide, suicide. It means to kill or cut. When you make a decision, that means we're not doing this anymore. We're doing this. In my experience as a coach, the most difficult thing is to make a decision, a well thought through decision and keep on that track because there's always somebody and I'm thinking of a particular person right now who as you go down this path this person wants to start going back to the way things used to be and they will drag you down and you'll drag some of your athletes down with them and that's the time of course you have to decide to get rid of them now this is one of the little charts I use as a thinking chart about how to measure things. Um, very quickly, I, I, I invented this thing, but this is a cost to benefit ratio. And I'm the artist who drew this, so enjoy this. It's based on Pareto's law, the 80-20 rule. And it comes very simply. I give an A to anything that's 20% of your effort, 20% of your investment, your work, your time, whatever that gives you back 80% of the benefits. For me, even if you're only Olympic lifting a little bit three days a week, you get back a massive amount of benefits from that. So the cost is 
three 15 minute Olympic lifting workouts a week. That'd be very short, but you're going to be able to keep yourself about 80% of where you started. Small cost, huge benefit. I give those things an A. Uh, when it comes to like, for example, with my business model, um, the work of making a book is a lot of work, but once it's written, you get these things called royalties later on. As you sit back five, six, 10 years later after you write a book, the cost of writing that book was very small compared to the benefits you received. So I look at royalties as an A grade too. B grades is when you put in this much work, you get this much back out. Uh, basically, I would include this as the power lifts. Uh, by the way, I did not say the Olympic lifts were better in the power lifts. I just said on the bang, the buck ratio, it's better. Um, you're, if you have a nine to five job, that's not your passion. That would be the benefits you get from that nine to five job. Uh, the medical insurance, uh, retirement, uh, dental care, income, your, your, your paycheck. You put in this and you get this exactly back. And of course the joke I always make is in fiber, you know, you put in and you get, okay. Um, and then the C grades are those little weird things. And this takes me back to Earl Nightingale's acres of diamonds. I constantly say yes to going to certain workshops just because, yeah, I might just get paid exactly that, but I never know when that C, that small cost might end up being the most important thing in my career. I, I have met people at workshops that have completely changed my career. The amount it cost me to fly and to have the hotel and meet the people there and stuff is minimal compared to the value of the relationships I picked up. Sometimes I'll buy equipment and uh, even some of the people I work with say, why are you wasting money on this piece of equipment? It's because I'm looking for the next A grade. So if I buy this equipment and it turns out to be better than a whole bunch of other stuff we're doing, that little C grade becomes an A grade. And of course, we all have our own 80, 20 is the wrong direction. Uh, you might have a family member who's this way. You might have a friend who's this way. Your cost is very, very, very high. And what you get back is very, very little. Um, whenever I look at an exercise that hurts athletes or a piece of equipment that tends to break and hurt people, I sit back and I say, that's an F. Get rid of it. Okay, so I grade every exercise, I grade every piece of equipment, and I grade every new idea as an A, B, C, or F. Protein, A. I'd say water's a B grade, or it could be an A if you really, really need it. Uh, veggies, veggies are a B. Uh, you can do this with nutrition, you can do this with any aspect of life. And of course, what I try to do with my movement matrix is I've tried to put together every A and B grade exercise that I can find and put them into one system. The reason I choose these particular exercises is that I have deemed that each of these is an A or B exercise. Um, picking the right exercise, of course, uh, always kind of depends. And this, this would be uh, my notes on a board from all the materials you've learned so far in the course. But uh, sometimes you really have to spend time thinking through, uh, a lot of time thinking through what's gonna work for this particular athlete. You know, if you have an 85 year old sprinter, uh, I can just see my mind popping in a whole bunch of tools right now, trying to figure out what the best exercise is gonna be for an 85 year old sprinter versus an eight-year-old sprinter. It's gonna depend sometimes on a lot of factors. So, once again, when you come back to these big things about, you know, is this exercise good or bad for a person? Is this uh, diet plan a good idea or a bad idea? I constantly fall back onto this little chart here with health, longevity, fitness, and performance, because 
I know this is that two things. A, you are right now the sum of your habits. There's some habits you may want to change. There's some habits your client may want to change, needs to change. Your athlete needs to change. Um, and the best way to go about them, of course, is with the system of pirate maps, which focuses on the process, not on the results. So with shark habits, it's funny I'm wearing one right now, it's the idea of one bite and it's gone. I picked this up, of course, by, from Rob Wolf. I have 16 pairs of the exact same polo shirt. I have six pairs of the same barbell uh, jeans. Uh, that's all true down there, the Nike Freeze. If you send me an email, I answer it. If I open the mail, I deal with it. I have shopping lists, I have menus, I have a household chores, chore list. Um, you just, when it's Tuesday, it's dark laundry day. And that's when I do dark laundry. Because, and then I do it and it's gone out of my head. So the pirate map, which comes from Pat Flynn, is this idea that people don't want a 400 page book. People want to just tell me what I need to do. So the pirate map is go to St. John's Island, find the white coconut tree, take seven paces to the west, dig down, there's the, there's the Trevor treasure. Well, for me, this is the most simple one I, I know for you. The night before, honor your sleep ritual. Make your coffee, <clears throat> take your supplements, whatever you need to do, take your medicines, whatever you need to do. Then sleep. And then in the morning, I believe you should be fast, you should fast and focus. And I say, be grateful and drink coffee. Eliminate, go through that to-do list. Then do some kind of exercise. Then eat like an adult, your first meal, protein, veggies, water. For a perfect day, do that again and maybe even again. Three short walks before meals is what Stu McGill recommends for back injuries. And then of course, then the three L's after that. Live, laugh, and love. Um, this is my current uh, map. My goal is to dance at my granddaughter Josephine's wedding. She, uh, not many people in my family live that long. So I have a sleep ritual. I make coffee for the morning. I take my supplements and I make tomorrow's to-do list. When I wake up, I'm grateful about something. I learned this from Pat Flynn and I, what I like about this is if I wake up and I'm not grateful, obviously I didn't get a good night's sleep. I use a little system called the one moment meditation. It's a one minute uh, meditation on my uh, iPhone. I do that every day. Some days I meditate an additional 15 to 30 minutes a day uh, when I have time. And sometimes those meditations turn into a one hour nap. Uh, every day I do work on an original strength and easy strength. Uh, uh, Tim Anderson helps me with that. I ruck once a week. That comes from my friend, uh, Mike Provost. And I do hypertrophy and 30-30 work as often as appropriate. And Josh Hills gave me a good piece of advice. Eat eight different vegetables every day. And at every meal, I try to get as many varieties of vegetables as I can. And then, of course, from there, live, laugh, and love. I have some others for you um, in, our other, in our other readings as we go through the course. Now, the problem with peaking and planning and programming is this very famous little thing um, that I've used many times from Doghouse. Uh, most people think that the road to their goals is this nice, gentle, uphill climb. And that has happened sometimes, I'm sure. Never for me. But the reality is, is you're going to have a long, dark night of the soul sometimes on your way to your goals. Things come up. Uh, bad things, good things, and you have to overcome them. You know, I have all these wonderful stories about my goal achievement in my life. None of them are as smooth and as linear as I like to think. Thankfully, you don't remember all the bad parts as you go to get your goals. Um, when it comes, uh, the four F's again, when it comes to fitness, finance, food, and relationship, in all of those areas of life, there's basically a few truths. Little and often a long, long haul, focus on quality, focus on the foundation and master the basics. You know, in the area of finance, we were having a discussion not long ago with some bank examiners who went off to high schools to talk to the kids about money management. And the sad thing about these high school seniors is many of them had not even the, the elementary understanding of things like balancing a checkbook or uh, debit and credit cards. And until they master the basics, they're going to struggle with something as 
Simple as understanding that if you graduate with a quarter million dollars in financial aid debt, you are going to climb a hard hill the rest of your life. So to me, the pirate map is everything that's about your goal. And the shark habits is everything that's not your goal. Um, the place I would like you to get to is the, what I call the land of live, laugh, and love, where, where I use Sister Maria Sumptas Compass here, where you balance work with play, rest with pray. And I'm to the point now that I try to tell people that if you get a goal, yes, you're going to work more, but plan in having more fun while you do it. When you train with me, it's always fun because I think it's an important part of keeping you around and getting you along the path. If you're gonna work harder, you gotta rest harder. And if you work harder and you play harder, you also need a little bit of alone time, which, uh, or enjoyment of nature or beauty or art, whatever, and we call that prayer time. And you're gonna need to have that balance figured out. And remember, if you decide to push one area of that compass, be sure you think about pushing the others along with it. Now, one thing is that my whole career has been helping people in performance, uh, sports, the arts, uh, military. Someone calls your name and you have to do something. Um, so for us, what we try to think is this way. Shark habits are going to empty your brain pan of stuff. Uh, and trust me, you, you don't want to be at the Nationals and think, you know, did I, did I leave my lights on? You don't want that inside your head. You, you want to clean your head out of the stuff. Number two, the, the pirate map is genius for most athletes. Uh, you're probably going to have five things there. If you do those five every single day the rest of your career, good things will happen. Um, programs, I don't really use much, but... What your job with as a coach is to remind the athlete, and I have the example here, Saturday, June 7th at 9 a.m. in Seattle, that's when you have to be ready. Whether you feel like it or not, that's when you have to be ready to go. And of course, principles. And the word principle means to capture first. Principles are the focus. The, the, the person who masters the principles tends to win. Whatever Whatever the key to the sport is, American football, block, tackle, fall on the ball, John Heisman, 1931. Uh, <clears throat> whatever the principle is, the team, the group, the athlete that focuses on the principles first tends to do the best most of the time. And if you also have the courage to take care of asymmetrical risks, you're going to be really hard to beat. So in the world of strength coaches, we basically have two principles. Number one, are my athletes up to standard? And if we say, if we say that, what we need to do is ask people who've been there before and say, well, what's the standard strength level for this sport people need to be? In American college football, they say 300 pound clean, 400 pound bench, 500 pound squat. Okay. For discus throwers at the international level, 400 pound bench, 250 snatch, 300 clean. 400, 450 squat, okay? Okay, if, you, if you're at those levels and you're not doing well in your sport, it's not the strength coach's fault. It's what you're doing there on the field of play. If you're not moving ahead and you have those standards, the next thing we look at is what are your gaps? And the gaps, are, <laughs> it can be this simple. Push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded, carry, everything else. Are you missing one of those? Yeah, we don't do loaded carries. Well, there's your gap. Yeah, we don't do any squats at all. There's your gap. Uh, we don't do any groundwork. There's your gap. Uh, everything else for the athlete is going to come from practice. Um, I'm not a huge believer in specificity training because, well, it has to be done really well. But most of the qualities for the sport outside of strength are going to come from the practice of the sport itself. And the assessment I use for, uh, for my athletes is a very simple phrase. Can you go? Because if you can't, well, we might as well go home. 
So my pirate map for lost coaches is kind of an easy one. I've used this a million times. Stretch what is tightening, strengthen what is weakening, have beautiful technique, strive for beautiful technique. That's it's so underrated. Eat like an adult, compete with your strengths, but work on your weaknesses. And then as a coach, try to make a difference. Try to, very few, if not none, of your athletes are going to go on and make billions of dollars. But there are going to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, nurses, parents, wonderful people. Let's make sure these experiences are a part, a positive part of their life. Uh, strengthen what is weakening and stretch what is tightening. Of course, I just pulled that from Yonda years ago. Uh, the push is deltoids and triceps. The pull is rhomboids. And then your glutes, glutes, glutes. Um, the glutes are the, the secret of power. You're sitting on a gold mine, that, all those jokes. And usually I just tell people, stretch the pecs, biceps, hip flexors, and hammies. And, and I got that from Yonda. All, all his information on tonic and phasic muscles. Um, uh, for eating, <laughs> I was told at the Olympic Training Center, I uh, don't know what the big deal is, the, the nutritionist said. Veggies, lean protein, and water, thank you very much. Um, I have up there, it says, eat like an adult. That comes from my book, Mass Made Simple. Um, if you don't, come on, eat like an adult. Um, I also include two other things. Train in a fasted state sometimes and stay hungry after sometimes. That's Arnold's famous line. Uh, there's nothing new about fasting. Uh, I got Hippocrates' famous line here. Obese people and those desiring to lose weight should perform hard work before food. Uh, that's the that's, There's your Fast 15 program from Pat Flynn. Meals should be taken after exertion while still panting from fatigue. They should, moreover, only eat once per day, and this next part is a little different, and take no baths and walk naked as long as possible. Well, things were different then, but... So anybody who says they invented intermittent fasting needs to call up Hippocrates. To some, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, principle-based training. One, strengthen what is weakening. Two, stretch what's tightening. Eat like an adult. And reasonable training, reasonable eating is going to be better than any idiotic fad forever. And, you know, I got a little line here. Now go change the world. Uh, that's one thing I wish we could do is bring reasonable back into all parts of our life. And now what I want to do f is summarize the books that I think uh, will assist you on your road to success. Um, one of the issues you're going to see here is I have a hard time when I'm looking at resources um, separating the mentor from the book. So what's going to happen sometimes is many of the books I'm going to recommend actually allowed me to go on and do something else and meet other people. Um, it'll be interesting. Uh, we're going to, uh, when I think about Ralph Mon, I always go back to the book, the track and field Omni book, where I first read about him uh, and decided to go to Utah State. When I read Seven Days of Sunday, I always think about how much I love the book and how Kenny Avery throwing the discus completely changed my life. So these are going to be the first four books that impacted me. The Ted Williams thing from Sears, uh, Bodybuilding Self-Defense, The Sword and the Stone, and Seven Days of Sunday. Those are That's my foundation books. Those are the ones that kind of got me started. The Sword and Stone and Seven Days of Sunday. That got me started as an adult reader. And Bodybuilding Self-Defense still makes me smile when, when I flip through the book. Now, for those of you who want to get more of a background in our field, and I think that should be every single person, there's a site called superstrengthtraining.com. And these are the four books I would recommend as a foundation. The Will, the, pardon me, The Way to Live by Hack is a book from 1910. And when you read it, you'll be like, well, why would you recommend a book from 1910 until you realize that nearly everything he does then has been remarketed dozens of times by other people. It's a foundational book that will tell you there's nothing new under the sun. The next one is Progressive Resistance Exercise by Watkins and DeLorme. And that's the book that gives you your concepts of, of uh, reps and sets. And it's some, some really interesting material 
on how weightlifting can change lives, especially those poor people who had polio or got blown up in World War II. Uh, that's, that's who those two studied. The next book is John Jesse's delightful uh, wrestling physical conditioning encyclopedia. Uh, John Jesse uh, really was a prolific writer in the 60s. Very insightful on strength coaching. Every exercise ever is in this book. I, I tell you, it's amazing. There's ligament training, there's sandbag training, there's kettlebell training. There's, there's a host of different things. If someone said they invented it, read this book. It was invented a long time ago. And then just a delightful read, probably one of the better writers in the history of strength training, John McCallum's Keys to Progress. Uh, the chapters on definition, which include the, the need for health and uh, health and longevity, uh, the definition diet, peripheral heart action, and jogging is some of the best writing I think has ever been in our field. And then just the stories are fun and delightful. Uh, that's really one of those books I say, enjoy. And at first you might go, what is this? And then pretty soon uh, you'll get suckered in and you'll enjoy it. Now these, there are some books that take us back into history. Now McCallum's book, uh, Bodybuilding and Self-Defense, I wouldn't say that uh, Ken Shamrock's Lion's Den is a page for page copy, but it is amazing how many of the things that Shamrock talks about are also in Callum's book. Uh, he calls, uh, like, le he has leapfrog in there. He's got rolling. He's got cartwheeling. He's got very basic, simple weightlifting. He's very basic, simple ideas on conditioning. Um, that's why I'm a big fan of the lion, uh, uh, Inside the Lion's Den by Ken Shamrock, because it does remind me of the way books used to be in our field that combine more than just uh, bodybuilding or, or strength. It, they, there are books that provide you everything. On that same line is Marty Gallagher's brilliant book, Purposeful Primitive. The nice thing about these books, almost every one of the books I'm telling you, they're historically important because they share history with us. Uh, Purposeful Primitive goes through the, the training of all kinds of titans in our, in our field, bodybuilding, power, and Olympic lifting. And then Marty goes through and pulls out the things that everybody seems to do. Now, this next list are some books that really influenced me, especially in the area of conditioning. Now, obviously, I'm going to be talking about Percy Sarity in just a few minutes, but these books, when they hit, they came across me, taught me about a lot of things about training normal people, what we call everybody else. You got Phil Maffetone's classic book, which I picked up when it first got published uh, in Fitness and in Health, also called uh, Every One is an Athlete. Uh, I've owned that book longer than I've been married, and I have grandkids, so that'll tell you it's been around. Of course, many of you know Maffy Tune from, uh, oh, he, he shows up in a lot of books like uh, Natural Born Heroes and some others, but he's from the Maffy Tone Method, which is 180 minus your age for your top end heart rate, uh, for the Maffy Tone tests, and the, his two week test. Steve Ilg's Total Body Transformation which I got for a dollar uh, because they were just getting rid of the book, which was the best dollar I've ever spent, is a marvelous look at combining yoga with cardiovascular work, with strength training, uh, with meditation and proper food. And it's a brilliant book. Uh, his one-month programs are well worth studying. Um, another book that I found to be uh, just brilliant reading, uh, Dr. Sheehan and Fitness, now, he was more of a runner. Um, he had been more influenced in the joggers, but his book is written like Montaigne. He's got like chapter on health, on fitness, on longevity, on this, on that. It's a wonderful read, all very short, all very insightful. If you want great research, though, on cardiovascular work, I always go back to Leonard Schwartz's Heavy Hands. Now, yes, it is that weird way of walking around the neighborhood with weights on your hands. It, just because it looks weird doesn't mean it doesn't work, though. And I just liked uh, Schwartz's insights on cardiovascular training. Uh, <clears throat> sadly, today you can go online and read someone just making up things about mitochondria and things like that. Schwartz was the real deal. He, he knew what he was talking about. He was a physician who studied uh, on the streets by walking hard. Um, brilliant book. 
All four of these I highly recommend. Oh, the reason I call it Jazz Musicians, Phil Maffey Tone also plays jazz music, which I found interesting. Um, it's, it's a great selection of books. Um, I know sometimes we just want to, we just want books that say, you know, lift to the limit, but we also need books that talk about fitness, longevity, and health. Now, if you want more information on these authors, uh, Marty Gallagher has a brilliant uh, blog uh, and the site is there for you. Steve Ilg's uh, uh, website is Holistic Fitness with a W and you can find articles about Leonard Schwartz on Clarence Bass's site, cbass.com, which by the way is the first website I ever went to when I first went on the internet. Now, these three books are really hard to find, but they are gold. The first one is John Jerome's brilliant Staying Supple. And whenever somebody who uh, names an exercise in the mobility or flexibility world after themselves, be sure you look at this book because you'll find that John Jerome had invented it uh, years ago. Tommy Kono's Weightlifting Olympic Style, absolutely brilliant. Now, if you can't find the book, it's, since his death, it's been harder and harder to find. Um, if you go to that website called The Tight Tan Slacks of Benzo Dan, um, his, his his articles are there too. Just I'm sure you could Google it easily and find his ABCs of Olympic lifting, which is what the base of this book is based on. Then finally, um, Jan and Terry Todd's great book, Lift Yourself to Youthful Fitness. They put together one of the first really doable periodization programs for normal people. And it's interesting because Clarence Bass followed that template for quite a while when he was, uh, oh, probably in his 50s. But it's a very simple month-to-month -month progression, very simple selection of lifts. It's the bench, the row, and the squat. Um, but the book is well-engineered, makes sense, and it's, uh, it's easy to read. Now, I'm no huge fan of periodization. Uh, not that I don't believe in it, it's just very difficult to do right. These four books, um, I don't know how easy it is to find training with surety now. Um, this guy who wrote it, by the way, basically has just di disappeared. People have been trying to find him for years, <coughs> including myself. Surety was that classic uh, track and field guy. Preseason, in season, off season, repeat. So I can't, I cannot tell you enough how great uh, training uh, with Surity is. It is a great book. A more recent book by uh, Dan Cleather is out called The Little Black Book of Training Wisdom. You might notice the person writing the foreword is a brilliant genius. But uh, uh, Dan's my boss at St. Mary's, and this book is just, a, it, is, it, it just cuts through everything and gets to what you need to know. Another book that's come out recently with Johnny Parker and Al Miller is called The System, Soviet Periodization for American Strength Coaches. Um, just does a great job summarizing uh, working periodization into a team setting, it's, which is the hardest thing to do. And this book is brand new right here, Strength Training Manual, but I just cannot recommend it enough. It's, it, is a, it is a really good look at strength training, and it would be a marvelous textbook uh, for a class, a college class. Now, in the areas of recovery and longevity, uh, you know, Wim Hof, it has almost become a cliche now in, our, in, in the business, you know, breathe deep and get cold. But this book, The Way of the Iceman, I thought was quite good. It summarizes things fairly well. Uh, just one reminder that the benefits of ice baths is the same benefits as sauna and steam. Uh, and I personally think that both, it shouldn't be an either or, it should be a both and. I love Stu McGill. I think he's a genius. I honestly think for someone like myself, his best work is The Gift of Injury. And it is a, a really fine walk through the mental ups and downs of being hurt. And as well as sometimes how the simple solutions like going for a 10 minute walk before every meal might be better than all the uh, extraneous nonsense people like myself do. Bill Guilford's uh, Spring Chicken, it, it, it's got Walter Longo's longevity diet in there, a fast mimicking diet. It's got stuff about, you know, ice bathing. <clears throat> There's uh, chapters on masters track and field athletes. It's very good. 
He's got a story about a man who weighed way over 400 pounds and was literally addicted to um, eating uh, carbohydrates and uh, changed his life completely around. It's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. A great book to travel with. Uh, and the last one up there is a book might be a little harder to find now. Now I usually don't like celebrity books. Uh, I, I guess I have a few, obviously, that I like, but. Uh, this particular book, Dr. Bob Arnott's Guide to Turning Back the Clock, oh, it's got to be sneaking up on 20 years or more now. But what I like about it is he's encouraging older people to become athletes again. He's encouraging people to go back to multi-ethnic eating. And it's just, it's a book that comes, there's, he explains power cleans. He's got a good stretching chapter. Uh, he's got a good lifting chapter. It's a good, solid piece of work. I mean, would it work in the areas of advanced performance? You know, why not? It's got good materials there. But he also spends time, each of these books talks about not only recovery, but longevity from that. So these four books should be considered when you're moving ahead in these two areas. Now, these four books are just a little different, but still important. I like books that make you think. The first one there, uh, Denise uh, Minger's book, Death by Food Pyramid not only takes apart the American food pyramid diet, which many of us agree is just mostly politics and not good science, but then she shares some ideas there about how you should look at the commonalities between diets and not what separates them. Try to find what every, every diet is going to recommend. I mean, basically every diet I know is going to recommend good protein sources, good fat sources, and water. And then let's focus on that. Let's, and all also agree, don't eat bad carbs, you know, from a box or bag. And let's do that. This next book, Ultralight Backpacking Tips, is this this little book I found and I just thought it was marvelous. Um, uh, it's these ultralighters like to do things like go on a 10 day camp with a 25 pound backpack. And the thought process, the cost of benefit discussions are what every good coach is constantly doing. We just don't have the resources to do that. What? Let's try this instead. BJ Fogg's book finally came out, Tiny Habits, been waiting for years. I've been following uh, Tiny Habits for a long time. Um, Tiny Habits is an idea of, uh, instead of saying, um, I'll never do X again, you shrink it down to something that's very simple. When I took the course, uh, I decided that I want to be safer about how I got in and out of the shower. So I started doing two push-ups before I took every shower to remind myself to get in and out safely. Remember, at my age, one of the most dangerous things I can do is slip and fall. I mean, so I wanted to fix that. Well, what's interesting is that now I have the habit of putting my hand on the shower wall every time I go in and out and my foot always makes sure there's no soap under there or anything slick. And I don't know, it's a marvelous way of looking at changing your habits. And remember, you are the sum of your habits. And this last book here, Pat Flynn's How to Be Better at Almost Everything. Uh, Pat's a good friend of mine, of course, but uh, I also like the idea in this book that if you take the tools of being a generalist, you can apply them to advanced learning. And I think that's the key. Um, some of us have to be good at a lot of things. Um, uh, you know, the, the cliche is specificity is for insects and that's fine, okay, that's true. But a lot of us have to be pretty good at a lot of things. And this book gives you a nice little toolkit on how to do that. Now, <laughs> someone's gonna raise their hand and say, well, what about, what about, what about? My little, for this particular list, my, my list for inclusion were this. Number one, all those books are very readable books. Uh, there's one or two technical books that are a little less, but they're still pretty readable books. They have stories in them and the, the authors are interesting. Uh, mm, I would say not tainted. Uh, none of the books on this list have uh, egregious uh, issues about them. You know, there are books, some really good books, writ, uh, written uh, in our field, in my field, uh, from people who are admitted uh, anabolic steroid users, using massive amounts of testosterone, doing this and that, you know, cutting corners here and there. 
I'm not judging. I'm just saying that I didn't want those books on this list simply because sometimes uh, not a lot of people can have the same advances uh, that the, the, the drug user uh, uh, is going to have. The, the, I just made the understatement of the century, the millennium. Um, number three, and this was a big one for me personally, I have read, reread, and re-reread every single one of those books. Number four, which is a tie-in, I have regretted loaning each and every one of those books because I have had to buy them several times. Uh, in the case of uh, the Maffey Tone book, I must be on my seventh, eighth, ninth edition. And number five is an odd one, but most of the books are applicable across general humanity. Maffey Tone's right there and it's said, everyone is an athlete. Um, bodybuilding and self-defense, there's nothing in that book that's going to push you away. Uh, the bulk of the books are pretty, you know, it, it, I don't think it matters what your gender is, your, your, your nationality, your race, your, what hemisphere you come from, what county you're from. Uh, there's a, there's lessons in every one of these books that's going to fully apply to you. And obviously there's dozens, thousands of other books I did not put on this list. So as we come to the end, uh, there's just one or two quick points I'd like to finish with. First is I hope you see the tapestry that I, I think you should have between your mentors, your coaches, uh, the community you work with, your friends, and the books or resources that you utilize uh, to increase, enhance your knowledge in the fields of fitness, health, longevity, and performance. Um, what I would like to keep pushing you to uh, is this idea that you continue to take the knowledge from science, the knowledge from the authorities, the knowledge from the best from the best, whip around these conversations, these dialogues with people who are on the same path and continue to find better and better ways to achieve our goals. Thank you.